You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. This week, Richard and I had the chance to follow up Father Paul's discussion of Genesis chapter 5 with questions, leading to an important discussion of the anti-kingly tradition of the Bible and its connection with the phrase, Son of Man. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. I appreciate the jumping back and forth because I think unless we're comparing the later text with the earlier text, we don't see the contrast, like you said. We have to talk about Seth twice. We have to talk about Seth's son twice. We have Seth at the end of chapter four, giving birth to Enoch, and then we have it again in chapter five. It goes back and forth. Is verse five necessary? 130 plus 800 is 930. Why do you need verse five? Only going back and forth Are you able to see that the author is doing something very specific in these different verses? Could you talk a little bit more about these examples? Well, number one, the examples have to be taken from the text. You know, to use something, I'm not saying that other people do it, but to assume that you could say, well, the author here could have added and so on. I do not accept that. I have to go by what he is saying. The totality of the years is very important. And since you asked about it, let's talk about it. It's too many years. I mean, it's unusual, extraordinary. You know, you're talking by the hundreds living. Where practically, you know, in the psalm you hear that the life of man is 70 and with some effort 80 or four scores and so on. The answer to that is that it is taken after the king lists of the ancient kingdoms. And the idea behind it is to link our time. Remember that in older civilizations, the center was the city, not only in Greece, but all over the place. That God creates his city and then assigns to it a king. You have it in Psalm 2. That's the world. It is around a city that is ruled by someone representing God and who follows his law. Now, to express the fact that the God of the city or the city was already a long time ago. Notice how Rome goes back to the she-wolf and Ramus and Romulus because you need to give it importance. You know, every newcomer is perceived as a usurper to say that the situation was like this for many centuries. You come up with these lists. Why do you need it? It's because if you are there, you have the maximum, the names of uh, what, six, seven, ten, twelve previous kings. Yes, but if you add their lifespans, you're going to end up with 1,000 or 1,200 years. (laughs) This does not impress the hearer that the city, if you like, is as eternal as your God way back. So they came up with this literary device whereby when you go beyond the known by you, you start throwing names with longer lifespans. Otherwise, you're going to need a long list of names, and it gets really impossible, if not boring. So you shorten comparatively the list by expanding the years. Now I come to its function in the Bible, because why? Ultimately, why? Because we don't have a king, we don't have a city. But again, that is a curveball, if I may call it, of the writer, to have the hearer who is aware of these lists, that humanity, humankind, 
does not proceed through kingly heirdom. So the text is anti-kingly. It is just through a male and a female knowing one another and giving birth the way God has set it in chapter 1. Meaning that you don't need kings. That is why kings will appear much later. It's very interesting. Things have proceeded for centuries and ages before the first mention of a king in chapter 14 of Genesis. That is the low blow. That is the punch. You don't need kingship. And with this, again, Richard, you stress the importance of going back and forth. It's a pre-setting for the famous chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, when the people wanted a king like the other nations. And Samuel told them, you don't need that because it is the Lord God who is the king of the scripture of Israel. So the answer to your question is there for me because I studied and I know the Bible will not come until chapter 6 with the shortening of the lifespan. I mean, you see what the author is doing. He's paralleling the story with the king lists, but he is eliminating kingship. It is basically the biological procreation, which, and I mentioned this several times already, is very clear in Psalm 45. I mean, you have a kingly psalm where the king, the human king, is addressed as Elohim, and yet the whole psalm is about his wedding. And at the end, you understand why, because it is through this wife who, by the way, is from Tyre. It's a nation, outsiders. You have children, and it is through the children that his name, his Shem, will last forever. Would you say a little bit about your discussion of Son of Man, Son of Adam in Genesis, and its use in other areas in the Old Testament, such as the prophetic tradition, or as it is applied to Jesus in the New Testament? Definitely. Let's go back to the kings and so on. The kings, all civilizations, the king is the son of God, meaning the son of the God of the city. It's his son, and son has a general meaning, which is basically one of a kind. That's why a son of a certain animal is the reflection of that animal. So, when you hear Ben Elohim, Ben El, that is only the king. The rest are human beings, which is Ben Adam. Again, I mentioned in other podcasts, like in Arabic until now, we refer to men as the sons of Adam and to the women, uh, the daughters of Eve. I mean, it's common language. Okay, you are the product of. But when you take into consideration being the son of God, on the other hand, then Ben Adam becomes a belittling. Let's jump to Ezekiel, where repeatedly he is referred to as Ben Adam. Why? Because originally he was a priest. And the priests were as divine as the king because they are his assignees to serve the temple of God. They are, in a way, if you like, divine. Functionally, friends, let's make this thing clear. There are no essences, okay, in the Bible, so don't twist my words. Functionally, they are divine. They work in the palace temple complex. But the king is merely involved in the palace, so he assigns the priests. 
But in Ezekiel, who is in exile, there is no more temple. God, if you like, remind him. Now, Zach, you are just a Ben Adam. And I'm addressing you as such. Now, this has its importance because this is retrojected in the life of Moses and Aaron, where Aaron is not only the high priest, but he is older than Moses. And yet, he is supposed to convey not the law of the temple, but it is the law of Moses that he got in the wilderness away from the buildings of Egypt and way before the buildings of Canaan. It is from there that he came. And to push, sometimes it's nice to learn, you know, that's why in the Bible you have, I mean, all scholars say that Jeremiah was patterned after Moses. You have the voice, the voice, the voice of God. And Aaron was patterned after Ezekiel. Let's put it this way. But interestingly, in the Bible, there is first Jeremiah and then Ezekiel. And that is no joke for me. And I say even more that Jeremiah throws his book in the Euphrates, which will be picked up by Ezekiel. That's a total hearing of the Bible. There are books, but there is still the totality, the way Genesis 5 is a book, but is this within a larger totality. So, in the New Testament, to come back to your specific question, Jesus systematically refuses to be called the Messiah and thus the Son of God, the coming King, and so on. And he sticks with the Son of Man, which is, again, scholarship has pointed this out a long time ago. It's the Son of Man who teaches in parables the way his predecessor, the Son of Man, Ezekiel, was Mashel, Mashalim, the parabler of parables. It's interesting that your question fits precisely within this approach of chapter 5 that is emasculating kingship as being the link from one century to another in the life of the city. It is contrasting this with eliminating this in favor of the just normal procreation that is the expression of God's blessing, meaning ultimately that God does not need a city. And this will come soon in chapter 11, where the human beings, again, the descendants of Noah said, no, we want to do it our way. And God intervenes powerfully and destroys it. They wanted to unite. He scattered them again by reminding them, you spread, you don't stay in one place. And there again, you have the shepherdism, the flock, and so on. It's pervading. It's pervading. You have, interestingly, Father, then a king without a city, without an army, who amasses no earthly glory, and who usurps the son of the gods. Well, well, he has. He has his own Sebaot. Remember, he's no wimp, the god of scripture. He has his own army, not of men, subjugated. Yes, not of men. And he usurps the position of the son of the gods in Rome as a son of man. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely so. You are totally on the mark here. But it's good to elaborate so that your hearers, when they hear your podcast, will see the weight, the weightiness of that. It's not just nice words. He didn't want to be known as the son of God. He wanted to be known as the son of man, like us, and so on. Well, he was not like us. He was the teacher. You see how very often we slip into this, what I call the Hallmark card approach. And we have to be very careful. Father Paul, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you very much. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.